and welcome everybody to another online Melting Pot Forum interview. My name is Hayley Cutler. I'm an international Kundalini Yoga teacher and I have had the pleasure of teaching at the Melting Pot Forum for the last two years. Sadly, this year, as we know, with the coronavirus, we've had to move the Melting Pot uh, and Colours of Ostrava to 2021. So today, I have on the show with me David Mickey. David Mickey is the internationally best-selling author of the Dalai Lama's Cat series of novels, as well as non-fiction titles, including Why Mindfulness is Better Than Chocolate, Hurry Up and Meditate, Buddhism for Busy People, and Buddhism for Pet Lovers. His books are available in 26 languages in over 40 countries. So welcome, David Mickey. Thanks, Hayley. Lovely to be on the programme. Absolutely fantastic to have you here. So, David, you were born in Zimbabwe. You've studied in South Africa. You've lived in London for 10 years, and now you live in Australia. Absolutely. So today, um, we're going to be talking all about mindfulness and how mindfulness is connected to nature. So David, you write a lot about our connection to nature, something that's a passion of yours, having, having started the concept of mindful safaris in Africa. Can uh -huh. spending time in nature help people through this time of the coronavirus and more generally? Definitely. Um, Haley, I'd just like to tell people who might be watching this program about the interesting connection that exists between us, which neither of us realized, but um, Haley also hails from Zimbabwe, would you believe? And she's been at the Melting Pot for the last couple of years. Um, I'm really looking forward to coming in 2021. But it's just amazing to me that two people who have such very common interests, who didn't even know about the existence of the other person, has been uh, connected or linked up by Melting Pot. So, but I'm sure we are just symptomatic of what happens right across the community in the world. Um, you're quite right, Haley. My, um, my main passion, or one of my main passions, is our connection to nature um, because we have a very odd view of nature I think as human beings in the early 21st century and the fact is that when we are out in nature we benefit in a myriad physical and psychological ways. Many people for example are really surprised when I tell them about this extraordinary fact you know every tree and every plant emits what we call phytocytes they are antifungal um, chemicals and they do that to protect themselves. It's like their immune system. And the interesting thing is that when we sit among trees or under trees or walk among trees, we breathe in these phytocytes and sometimes we can smell them like if you're walking in a cypress forest or a pine forest, you know that wonderful tangy smell that you get. That is from the phytocytes. And what is interesting is that when we breathe in these phytocytes, our own immune system uh, responds in a very powerful way. And it's been shown that when we spend about six um, hours or more um, un in nature, it doesn't need to be in one day, it could be over a period of days, but when we spend about six hours among trees or under trees or plants, our own immune system, the natural killer cells in them, is elevated by 40%. So we actually benefit in a very tangible physical Way by spending time out in nature. And many people are kind of surprised when they hear this, but that's just one of the many kind of invisible or intangible and powerful associations, uh, connections that we have with nature. Uh, wow. I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. I think a lot of us forget the simplicity of being in nature. I think that's, that's uh, absolutely um, fantastic. You know, who would have thought? I mean, we all we all go out in nature, but I think a lot of us are so unaware of that fact, you know, the, the actual physiological effect that it's having on the body and the mind. Uh, it's extraordinary. So we all should be getting out into nature a lot more. Definitely. In fact, in um, places like Japan and South Korea, it's public health policy uh, to create forests outside all the major cities and they encourage the citizens to spend time at the weekends. Um, they've got what they call a nature pyramid, you know, a little pyramid shaped thing, which is at the bottom level. We should all try and get our nature fix on a daily basis, even as, if it's just sitting on a park bench for five or 10 minutes. And then every week we should try and get a more uh, extended fix, like go for a long walk in a park or a forest. And then at least every six months, we should try and spend like a good week away uh, 
out in nature, because we are nature is the kind of paradoxical thing. Even though we feel that we're somehow different and separate, we don't have very much to do with the natural world, the reality is that every single cell in our body uh, comes from the earth. It's, it comes directly from the earth if we eat vegetables, or it comes from animals that ate vegetables if we are carnivores. But one way or another, every cell in our body consists of what comes from the earth and water. And that's what we are. We are 90% water. We come from the earth, and we um, are, of course, every breath that we take and ex exhalation is an exchange with the trees and the plants around us. We give them our carbon dioxide, they give us their, um, their oxygen. And so we're in this reciprocal arrangement. We are part of nature, we emerge from nature, we are nature. And, and yet we tend to forget it. We've kind, of, we've kind of lost sight of that fact, even though for 200 years, um, you know, we've been, we've been living this very urban lifestyle, dislocated from nature, not to the extent that some kids think that milk comes from factories. You know, it's kind of sad in the major cities. They have no understanding. But 200 years ago, all human beings had to know about nature because you lived or died according to your understanding of natural cycles and the way the natural world worked. So but the reason I'm so passionate about it is I think we, when we spend time in that nature, uh, whether we understand why or not, it doesn't really matter, but we have a, a very intuitive and heartfelt sense of reconnection uh, when we're back in nature. Yeah, wow. I mean, what, what a great answer. Yes, that's why we feel so good. We feel bad. We, we feel balanced. We feel calm. Um, fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's another thing about nature is that um, it has a way of drawing us out of our thoughts. Um, you know, mm -hmm. psychologists or neuroscientists in particular have this concept that we're in one of two modes at any time. We're either in direct mode or we're in narrative mode. Direct mode is when we're paying direct attention to what we're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. So that's direct mode. Um, narrative mode is when we're lost in our thoughts. Um, and the fascinating thing is a, a study was done by um, Harvard Psychology Department with 2,000 um, smartphone owners. And they sent them three different questions at different times of the day saying, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And how happy are you? And it found around 47% of the time, people were not thinking about what they were doing. They were thinking about something else. So you might be standing there washing the dishes, but you're actually thinking about the row you've just had with your spouse or uh, an email that you forgot to send or whatever it is. You're in narrative mode. Okay? You're not actually attending to the washing of dishes, which, let's face it, is boring. Um, so, and, but what was interesting about this is that direct correlation between thinking about what you're, uh, sorry, between paying attention to what you're doing and your self-reported levels of happiness. And the conclusion of the study was uh, the ability to pay attention to what is not happening, the cognitive achievement becomes at an emotional cost. So basically, the more likely we are when we're paying attention to what's actually happening, the more likely we are to be very happy. And the good thing about nature is it plucks us out of narrative mode. It forces us to to attend to what's actually happening. You know, a bird will come out of a tree and dive bomb and, or something will happen, you'll hear the rippling water or you'll smell something that we haven't smelt before. And that takes us out of our narrative mode. And so nature in a kind of interesting way is like ecotherapy. It's just taking us away from our uh, unhappiness, creating thoughts and bring us back to the present moment. Because the present moment is where you find happiness. You know, we cannot be happy. Uh, we in the past we can't find happiness in the future because the, neither of those things exist the only place you can actually be happy is here and now and that's what nature does it brings you back to the here and now oh david that was uh, absolutely beautiful it's so true because there is no past there is no presence it really is about the here and now wonderful so you are probably best known in the Czech Republic for your Dalai Lama's cat series and other books about Buddhism. Is there a convergence in some way between Buddhist teachings and being in nature? Definitely. Um, the essence of Buddhism is the study of the mind. Uh, the Dalai Lama often says this. Um, Buddhism is all about understanding the nature of mind, the nature of consciousness. What is your consciousness? And one of the reasons that meditation is so central and so important to Buddhism is because meditation uh, enables us to develop our mindfulness so that we can attend to the present moment. Um, and so meditation and being aware of the present moment really is, gives us access to mind. 
And as I was just saying a moment ago, when we're out in nature, we are far more likely to be in the present moment uh, and attentive to what's actually going on in the here and now uh, than when we're in, say, an urban setting. So that's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about getting people out into nature or people having regular nature fixes is because it naturally brings us back to, uh, to the present moment. And we often have a, a very strong sense of coming home to ourselves. It's something we, we wouldn't necessarily it's find hard to put into words, but there's just a sense of peacefulness, of well-being, of coming home to oneself when we're out in nature and just being in the present moment. And so that's why there's this direct correlation between what Buddhism tells us about um, coming home to the present moment uh, and attending to what's happening in your mind and being out in nature, because both things essentially bring us to the same point. Mm. Yeah, they figured that out thousands of years ago. And uh, because, you know, when we think about, when I think about Buddhism, I immediately get a picture of nature. I, I immediately, it conjures up those kind of feelings and thoughts about being in these serene uh, forests, these environments um, with the temples and uh, yeah. just being in these natural surroundings. So, yeah. Well, all the great spiritual teachers of the past, interestingly, um, have uh, found, uh, have had their breakthroughs in nature. Uh, Buddha became enlightened under a Bodhi tree. That's why the Bodhi tree is a symbol of Buddhism or a symbol of Buddhism. Um, and in the, in the Bible, there's a story of Jesus going into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. Uh, and that was a real turning point in his uh, spiritual journey. Um, and um, among kind of lesser mortals, if you like, um, the access to nature and, and being in nature has always been seen as a, a critical part of creativity. You know, Wordsworth wrote his beautiful poem, poems about you know, uh, uh, daffodils, um, and uh, Beethoven, many people are surprised to hear this, Beethoven literally was a tree hugger. He had a favorite tree outside his, his garden, he used to go and hug his tree, and he had found that a source of creativity and inspiration. And Gaudi, um, the famous artist from Spain, who, uh, sorry, the architect from Spain, um, who created those wonderful structures in Barcelona, like the Sagrada Familia Cathedral, um, he said, if you want to be original, go to nature. Um, and Tesla and Aristotle and Darwin were all very, very keen advocates of nature. And this whole concept of um, solvitur ambulant uh, in Latin, which has been walking, uh, solving problems by walking. Where? Walking in nature. There are so many different famous people um, through the centuries who've all come to the same conclusion that being in nature is the best chance. You can actually be creative and you can come with up, up with those original breakthroughs and insights. Um, so uh, fascinatingly, more recently, in a more kind of mundane pedestrian way, if you like, a study was done where people were, uh, were broken into two samples. One sample walked through a city and the other sample walked through a forest. And they were then given a creativity test called a remote associate test. And it was found that the, the people that walked through nature uh, were far more creative than the people who just walked through the city. And there are statistically identical samples. The only difference was that. So it is really fascinating how when we are in nature, we benefit on myriad different ways. It's, it's not just it is not just that we have more natural killer cells in our bodies, although that's a good thing, especially in the time of coronavirus virus, but it's also that we we, we benefit from, from creativity, from originality, uh, even IQ, our intelligence is honed by being in nature. There are so many different ways in which we benefit from being out there. Fascinating. You know, it really makes me think, um, you know, if we were to, if, if the educational systems were to incorporate more walks and, 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 and uh, just taking students out into nature to actually help them, literally help change their brains so that they mm. can become more creative. And, you know, it just makes you think sometimes when you're working on your own projects at home and you get that writer's block or whatever you're working on, you know, to actually just say, right, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, not, not keep pushing and try and find the answer. I'm just going to take myself out into nature, just go and sit under a tree, walk in the forest, be near in the lake, whatever it is, and just use that opportunity to really um, allow the kind of inspiration to, to come to you. And then, I'm sure it will, will give you the inspiration to then continue with whatever it is that you're working on. So, yeah, this is such a beautiful way of, of looking at um, being and um, communing with nature. Love that. Um, mm. 
So, David, what was it about Buddhism that drew you to it as an ordinary Westerner? Um, and is a quiet mind achievable for most of us? Right. Okay. Um, well, I started meditating back in 1994. I was living in London and had a very stressful job at the time. Um, so much so that I started to break out in rashes. I got hives and itchy spots in my body. And I went to a doctor and they prescribed me antihistamine, antihistamines, which are very effective, but they were only masking the symptoms rather than treating the cause. Um, and so I went to a naturopath who basically suggested that um, I should spend time meditating every morning. And I did for 10 minutes every morning. Um, and so interestingly, um, after about six weeks, I found that I was really benefiting from, from, uh, from meditation. Uh, there's a famous Buddhist sage called Chantideva who once said, uh, I can't cover the entire world with leather to avoid stepping on thorns, but I can wear leather on the soles of my feet. And what he was basically saying is that we can't control reality, but we can control the way we experience reality. And we do that by managing our own minds. We're back in the business of being an effective thought manager. And so without realizing what I was doing, I was sort of just stumbling into it like people generally do, um, I was starting to take control of what was happening in my own mind. And yes, it is definitely possible to, um, to quieten your mind. Uh, everything is relative. You know, there's, uh, for millennia, there has been what is called the nine stages of meditative concentration. And stage number one is when basically you spend more of any one session thinking about things other than the object of meditation. So you might be sitting there trying to focus on your breath for 10 minutes, but for, let's say, seven of the minutes, you're busy thinking about all sorts of other things. You know, probably this crazy, you know, feverish thoughts, everything apart from your breath. And that's normal. Okay, so people often think, oh, you know, I can't meditate, my mind's too busy. Well, we're all in the same boat, okay? But you've just got to persist. It's, it's just like going to the gym. There are so many parallels between physical training on the one hand and mental training on the other. And so if we persist, we can find little by little, step by step, just chipping away at it. Instead of seven min minutes, it'll go down to six minutes, to five minutes, and eventually spending as much time on the object than not on the object. And then eventually our capacity to remain focused on the object extends from just 30 seconds to 40 seconds to one minute. It's just like any physical training. And so, yes, it is possible. Um, now, because we live, live such busy lives and we're all on social media and watching the news and getting involved in this and that, it's unlikely that we're ever going to be quite the same as somebody who heads off to a cave in the Himalayas and rigorously disciplines them, you know, systematic, decent, uh, systematic um, removal of all uh, sensory things. Uh, it's unlikely that we're ever going to achieve that ninth level uh, of what's called calm abiding but we can make good progress towards it. And frankly, we only need to make very, very small progress towards that to start to enjoy massive benefits. It's a bit like if you're completely unfit and unhealthy and you sit on the couch all day eating junk food and drink lots of Cokes and never do a, a moment's exercise. All it takes for you to slightly change that unhealthy lifestyle, and you think, goodness, you know, I can actually get off the sofa without feeling like, you know, I'm gonna break my legs or something. If you don't have to make massive changes, in other words, to enjoy massive benefits. Absolutely. Um, I'm a huge proponent of everything that you're saying, being a, a yoga teacher myself. And um, you're so right. It's if you give that five, ten percent, it you get a hundred percent back. It's people should feel encouraged to decide and consciously choose to set aside five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it is that you can manage in your day um, because that's really going to help to just create those new neural pathways in the mind uh, you know I can I can sit still for five minutes I can just be aware of my body and my breath and it's anybody can do this it's not about being in any you know great physical shape it's got nothing to do with that it's just can you sit can you close your eyes can you be mindful of your breath going in and out and can you just begin to to quieten the the chatter um so yeah i mean i think it's we have so sorry. many different um we have so many different aids there are wonderful apps out there that people if they're interested in pursuing this can access like insight timer headspace calm smiling minds those are just a few i have downloads on my own website 
people get just download them free and you basically sit there with your headphones on listening to somebody for 10 minutes so you don't even have to think about what you're going to do you just plonk yourself down a nice straight back that's the only main thing you have to do and follow the instructions uh until you get used absolutely. to doing it you can go solo uh, absolutely absolutely david yeah it's it's kind of it's childproof <laughs> so um yeah i think yeah i i feel everybody should feel encouraged to uh yeah to to apply um yeah. these techniques in their life so david in your book Buddhism for pet lovers, you write about the benefits of mindfulness in our relationship with pets. Would you like to explain a little bit more about this? Sure. Well, um, I'm often struck by the fact that our closest companions in the world are often our pets rather than other human beings. Uh, many people, 30%, I think, of people in the Western world are single person households. But if you Actually, if there was data collected on pets, I suspect you'd find that a lot of those 30 percenters actually have a cat or a dog or a budgie or something. Um, and so they are, in fact, living with another sentient being. Um, uh, so it's kind of interesting that and, and even if we do uh, have a mother or father or spouse or children, uh, often people are at their least inhibited uh, when they're with a cat or a dog you know, sitting in the corner of the room. Um, it's kind of interesting how important our, our non-human um, friends are to us. Um, and yet the most interesting thing about, or the most obvious thing about um, pets is that they can't speak. You know, they don't speak English or Czech or any other language uh, verbally. However, they do communicate. Um, and most of us are really good at communicating with our pets in terms of talking to them, uh, but it's one-way traffic. You know, we're very good at talking to our pets, but we never stop and listen um, because we don't really, you know, it doesn't even strike us that we should be listening or paying attention. But when we are practicing mindfulness, um, it's kind of interesting because, you know, animals do communicate and the way they communicate is through nonverbal communication. They are experts in nonverbal communication because that's, that's their game. You know? They're on to English or Czech. They are into, into nonverbal. Um, and so they detect subtle changes, the most subtle changes that escape us because we're focusing on blah, 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 blah. Um, they're, but they're focusing on other stuff. And that's why they're so good at detecting changes of expression, of mood, just of energy, of poise, of posture. They can read us, you know, so, so well. Um, and the thing is that we need to, if we want to be in a good communicating relationship with them, we need to get onto the same page as them onto the non-verbal page and the way we do that is by quieting our minds because there's no way on earth we're going to be able to pay attention to tune in to our pet cat or dog if we're sitting there locked in narrative mode thinking about emails and social media and what we're going to do this weekend and what we should have said to that person shouldn't have said to the other one you know we, we just our minds are too busy to communicate with animals but when we let go of this busyness and are quiet with an animal it's just amazing how we're able to start noticing things that are maybe quite obvious or should have been obvious, but that weren't. Like in one of my books, um, a book of short stories, uh, I have a story about a woman who was good at talking to her cats, but she um, never listened to them until she had a heart attack. And um, her doctor told her to start meditating to deal with stress. And that's basically once she did start meditating, she found this extraordinary thing happening. <clears throat> her cat started to come and sitting, sit with her when she meditated which is exactly what my experience and many other people, animals love it when you meditate. They can detect that change of energy. They know that you're now in the present moment or at least trying to be. Um, and they love the calmness and the peacefulness that comes over you. Um, and so I sometimes joke to my wife that I'm a pussy magnet when I meditate because basically the cats come up wherever they are in their house to come and sit next to me because they, they just like the energy. They like the vibe of being next to you. And when you are with uh, animals and pets, um, you can you start to notice things about them. Like this, the story that I wrote was based on a real life experience of a woman whose cat kept coming up to her and nudging her right here in the chest and right in the heart. Um, and it was only after she had a heart attack she realised what the cat was trying to communicate. And there are other stories of people who go like swimming with dolphins, which is quite a popular thing in, in places like you know off Perth where you can go out in a boat and um, and dolphins yeah. some known to come up and nudge people you know, in the side, um, on the side of their body. And people have then gone and had scans. They found they've got a cancer tumor there. You know, dolphins can, can perceive things in three dimensions. They can see when something's not quite right. They are quite capable of, of, um, of communicating on a level. But we need to be 
are on the same page as them to realize that they are communicating uh, and to try and work out what exactly they're trying to communicate. So one of the reasons that I'm so excited about uh, a concept of mindfulness in relation to pets and animals, I, I, I focus on pets because they're the animals that are in our lives, generally speaking. You know, we can go into Africa and spend time with elephants as, as I have the fortune to do every year, which I love to do. But most people, it's cats and dogs or horses and budgies. Um, but we've, when we are present with these animals, it's just extraordinary how the depth of our relationship um, can become a lot more profound and we feel a lot more closer engaged with our pet and our pet with us when they realize we are actually trying to get on the same page as them. And I, I liken it to, imagine if you'd had to take an, a person to the shopping mall from time to time um, and all they do is talk at you, chatter, chatter, chatter. Uh, it's just everything's busy and hectic and they're constantly, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if they just shut up for a minute and allowed you to talk to them and reduce the stimulation? And it, wouldn't it be amazing if you could actually get a, a, a word in? Um, and that's, I think, must be the feeling that our pets have, is that we're all so busy, we're always chattering, we're always hyper-stimulated. Well, just shut up, you know? Just be quiet. Just allow, allow your pet to speak to you if it wants to. Maybe it doesn't, but maybe it does. <laughs> so, so beautiful. Um, yeah, I really feel that. I've, I've, had, uh, I've had a dog before, and I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Whenever I'd be practicing yoga, the dog would, would actually keep coming and, and, and lying next to me. Um, and then yeah. right at the end, when I was meditating... <laughs> He'd just be wanting to like lie on my lap. And so they do feel they're so in touch with energy really, and, and our temperament. Yeah. So mm. I think there's a lot to be learned. And I just love what you say about the constant chattering. And wouldn't it be nice if we could just dial it down and mm. actually be able to communicate in a non nonverbal way with our, with our pets. It's so beautiful. So David, you've already written 13 books. Which one do you see as the most useful or essential? So if we were stranded on a desert island, which book would you be recommending to me as the go-to? Right. Well, I would find that enormously difficult because they are different books written for different purposes. Um, I started out writing a number of books like Buddhism for Busy People and Hurry Up and Meditate because I wanted to convey or communicate these these really important messages. But then I discovered there are a lot of people that never read nonfiction. And it's not because they're unintelligent or whatever. It's just that they, a lot of them are people like accountants, journalists, um, lawyers, who spend their weeks in, in, engrossed in nonfiction. And the last thing they want to do at the weekends or on holiday is read yet more nonfiction. They want to be taken out of themselves. They want to be escapism, entertainment. And so that's the reason I wrote the novels, is because they contain precisely the same lessons, but packaged up in an entertaining format. So I think um, what would be the best book uh, for you, whoever you are, depends very much on your personality, your likes, your dislikes. So whether you want uh, to access an understanding of Buddhism or meditation in a non-fiction format or in a, a novel format, um, I hope that in the range of books that, I, that I've written and continue to write, you'll find something that resonates with you. What, I'm, what I see my mission as transmission, you know, very briefly. Um, and so uh, I, I'm trying to transmit the Dharma, the, the Buddha's teachings, in a way that's highly accessible to people and enjoyable, because it should be enjoyable. Buddhism should be fun. If it's not, there's a problem. You know, you should be, you should be growing and really appreciating it and be excited um, by these concepts. I'm certainly excited by them. And so, yeah, I would say just look at the, um, look at the, the, the variety. There's the Dalai Lama's Cat series. I've written a number of thrillers, Buddhist thrillers, um, and also nonfiction books if you prefer to get things straight. So it really depends on, on how you like to um, ingest your information. That's fantastic. So there's a real range uh, that people can choose from. I think that's wonderful. Um, you know, it's, it's so beautiful that, that your books are so accessible. Um, and I think that's what, you know, that's what we need. We need, we need to be able to absorb uh, this ancient wisdom in, a, in an easy, accessible way and fun, like you say. So David, how do you protect yourself from the waves of negative energy that flow to us from the media? So, have you been watching the media a lot over the last months during this coronavirus or do you tend to tune out? What's your stance on that? 
Um, no, I view the media very much as the same as food, uh, in the sense that we are putting something into our system. Um, and just as we attend to what we uh, stick in our mouth, um, we should be equally attentive to what we uh, stick in our ears and, and eyes. Um, in other words, you know, um, by all means, go out and have a binge from time to time <laughs> and eat your <laughs> fried food and enjoy your ice cream or whatever the case may be. Um, but don't make a habit of it and don't make it your regular thing. Otherwise, it will affect you negatively. So um, when it comes to the media, I would say choose your news source uh, carefully. Uh, and stick to that generally and and don't have too much of it otherwise it'll probably affect you in a negative way um, you, we want to understand that the agenda of the news media which is not just uh, in an impartial way to communicate what's happening there's a the very strong agendas going on so we need to just be a little bit discriminating and sensible and intelligent about our use of media but certainly being a hermit is not necessary um, um, I know a lot of Buddhist lamas who are, you know, very engaged and know exactly what's going on around the world. Um, so we don't need to hide away in a cave. But I think, you know, we just need to be disciplined in the way we, we absorb the media and just as we are in, in the way we, uh, we live physically. I love that. I absolutely love that kind of analogy um, because we become, well, you know, this phrase, you are what you eat. So literally, you know, we are what we absorb. We are what we take in. And we, we, have, think, yeah. we are what we listen to. Absolutely, David. Yes, we are. Um, I actually gave up having a TV over 10 years ago. So I don't have a TV in my house. I have my laptop. So I tune in when I want to into all these, uh, you know, media platforms to find out what's going on. But I, yeah, I stopped having the TV on 24 hours a day because I just realized that there is a lot of negative negativity coming out of these news platforms and you know I wanted to really um reduce that so and and I have to say since not having a tv for me I feel I'm, I'm not really in fear I'm I feel very calm but that's just me personally so everybody you know has yeah. the choice to, to tune in and tune out of what they choose to so David let me ask you in Buddhism suffering is not seen as an inherent inherently bad thing why is that and as people are uh, going through this coronavirus and of course there's been a lot of suffering there's been many people that have been passing uh, because of this virus um is there any way that, that buddhism these buddhism teachings can help people to transform this suffering uh, definitely. I think um, one of the most the best known symbols of Buddhism is the lotus plant, or the lotus flower. Um, you see it on just about any temple that you go to, and it's on many book covers and publishing companies use it as a logo. And so the lotus is well known in association with Buddhism. But what does the lotus actually symbolize? Um, lotuses grow in very muddy, swampy conditions. The conditions in which they grow are typically quite revolting, you know, smelly and dirty and mucky. Um, and yet they are the most transcendently beautiful flowers. I mean, when you see these images of lotuses, I mean, they're very, very popular for, for a very simple reason that they appeal to all of us. Uh, it doesn't matter what race, culture or creed or time you live, they are beautiful looking flowers. And so that is used as a metaphor for the fact that um, not despite, but because they grow in these very, very swampy, muddy conditions. They're able to use that muck, that detritus, that decaying stuff in the mud to propel them to transcend through the muck, to come to the surface and to grow and to bloom and blossom as the most beautiful, exquisite looking flowers. And so in the same way, when bad things happen to us, and def bad things will definitely happen to each one of us, sadly, it's a fact of being a human being, we have a choice in how we deal with that bad thing. Are we going to allow it to um, destroy us, to crush us? Or are we, can we find something in that experience, negative as it is, to propel our own growth to transcendence? Um, the, you know, the Dalai Lama himself often says, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And what he means by that is bad things will happen to us. We will lose loved ones. We will ultimately lose our own life. We will have financial or health or legal or all kinds of challenges. Each one of us is going to happen. But whether or not we continue to suffer because of that 
is up to us. And suffering is, um, comes from the Latin word meaning to carry. And when we carry things, it means and from a mental perspective, we keep returning to it in our mind. Something happened 10 years ago, we still think about it every day. Nobody's forcing us to think about it. We forced it on ourselves. We've created a habit of remembering bad things or painful things that have happened. And so that's why he says suffering is optional because we don't have to keep carrying it. We don't have to um, be crushed by things. We can, in fact, um, try and extract a positive uh, outcome from what happened and focus on the positive things in order to propel us towards something transcendent. And there is a positive message from any negative uh, experience that we have, but it's really up to each one of us in our own way to find what that positive thing is. And so um, when we're able to do that, uh, that is when it becomes possible um, to transcend and to attain uh, that transcendence. Hence the a beautiful phrase with Thich Nhat Hanh often uses uh, the famous Zen teacher who's based in France at Plum Village. He very, says very simply, no mud, no lotus. No, without the suffering, there can be no transcendence. Um, and so, you know, um, I often reflect on that. Uh, often the people who have suffered the most in life are the most beautiful people. They're compassionate, they're open, they have you know, hum humble, um, and those are the people that are, it's just nice to be with. We have a, a sense that, of niceness about them. Um, because they've endured the suffering, it's not in spite of, but it's because of. And so it's up to us also to find um, the transcendence in whatever negativities we experience. Beautiful, yeah. I, I, that's so beautiful, David. Um, I, I, I really, I, I, that resonates, that resonates a lot. Um, without mud, there is no lotus. And it really is about how we choose to navigate what's happening in our lives. Because like you said, it's, it's, it's inevitable. Life happens, life is happening and it will continue to happen. And we can't stop bad things from happening. So really it's about cultivating that, that, that awareness and that um, ability to... We always have choice, basically. We always, we always have, have choice. choice, yeah, we always have choice. <laughs> Uh, you know, Viktor Frankl, the famous uh, Holocaust survivor and psychiatrist, uh, who actually um, went through Auschwitz and he survived. Uh, he saw at first hand, you know, the most horrific things that can happen to people. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, even in the worst situations, um, when everything has been taken from you, you still have one freedom left. It's your last human freedom, and that's freedom of choice towards what is happening. Freedom of your freedom of attitude. Sorry, freedom of attitude towards what's ha happening. And so that's a freedom that many of us overlook. We think when bad things happen, oh, I can't help it, I'm depressed because such and such happened. Well, you do actually have a choice. You know, you don't have to feel like, like that. It can feel like um, overwhelming sometimes, but ultimately we all have choice in our attitudes. And that to me is a, an amazing and liberating discovery to make. Absolutely, we do. We, we have a choice. It's the most empowering uh, thing to, to, to realize for all of us, because that's what's going to set us free in the end. So thank you so much, David. It's been absolutely wonderful to have you um, in, on this interview today. It's been an absolute joy and thank you for sharing all your wisdom uh, with the viewers today and encouraging people to go out into nature, spend more time, slowing down, becoming more mindful. Uh, and as you mentioned, you have, uh, you've written all these wonderful books. So hopefully people have been inspired to, to pick up one of those books one day and uh, really start to cultivate more mindfulness in their, in their lives. So thank you. thank you. Well, thank you. And I look forward very much to coming to Melton Pot uh, Forum in July. And also after the forum, um, we've got this wonderful Meditate in the Mountains retreat, uh, which I'll be leading for five days, where we do exactly that. We go and we meditate in the mountains, outside as much as possible, weather permitting. Um, and uh, it's something I do every year anyway. I take groups to Africa. Um, so we won't have any uh, herd of elephants or, or prides of lion walking past, I trust, in the Czech mountains. Um, but we will have uh, nature in all its glory. So I'm really looking forward to that and can't wait to meet um, people uh, at both the Melting Pot Forum and at Meditate in the Mountains the, the following week. So thank you so much to everybody who's joined today, who's listened to this interview. And my final word really is just to say that it's, it's such an honor to actually be 
connected um, to everybody on this platform. I feel like we're one big family, the melting pot family in the colors of Ostrava. And really this is a time for everybody to recognize that we're all connected, we are all one, and it's a time to really use this time as an opportunity to, to raise our vibration, to keep our spirits high, and to recognize that so much uh, goodness can come out of, um, of this period of time. So with that said, myself and David are looking forward to seeing everybody next year, 2021, at the Colors of Ostrava uh, and the Melting Pot Forum, and then afterwards on the retreat in the um, Pesky Mountains in uh, the Czech Republic, and just really um, living what we've been speaking today about enjoying being in nature and really cultivating a deeper sense of awareness um, for ourselves. So uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of uh, the evening, David. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you to the Melting Pot team who have invited uh, myself and David on this platform. And um, yeah, enjoy everybody. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.